we were growing up, my mom and dad always taught us that to give somebody a gift, it doesn't always have to be a purchased item or something tangible. You know, you can give the gift of your time. Uh, so we knew we loved to sing together, and we figured, why not go and, and, and Christmas carol for our friends? Well, and we really thought it was important to keep the tradition of caroling, like, alive because it seems like nowadays nobody really does it that much anymore, and it's just it's just a really fun tradition to do. Yeah. And we really love to see friends at Christmas time. It's super just fun and joyful, and it's just like this happiness you never get throughout the rest of the year. Of course, the best part is when they invite us in for hot chocolate and cookies, so oh, we always, yeah. we always oh, enjoy yeah. that. Bring it on.
morning. It's wonderful to be here on uh, this Sunday before Christmas. It's a privilege this morning uh, to introduce to you uh, Sue Pinsley. Uh, Sue has family in our church. Her brother is Dr. Grady Burris. Uh, Sue grew up in a, uh, another uh, denomination, but she received Christ in her heart as, uh, as a child. Uh, but has never been immersed, never professed Christ through uh, immersion. And today, uh, as she comes forward, uh, I asked her, I said, what, what brought you to this point? And she said, it is that affirmation that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior and to let you know that Jesus lives in her heart. So if you'll just face this direction. And if you'll give me, you just put that. So it's a privilege to ask, who is Jesus Christ to you? He is my Lord and Savior. Amen. So upon your public profession of faith in Christ and obedience to his command, it's such a privilege to baptize you, my Christian sister, on this Christmas week, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. How wonderful. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.
His name is Jesus. Let's stand together. Sing with me. Hark the herald angels sing. Let's glorify the King today as we sing this great carol together. Sing with me. Hark the and you may be seated. Good morning. I'd like to welcome each of you to the service this morning. Uh, welcome guests uh, here today. We welcome you. I know in the early service we had several uh, that were home for the holidays and we uh, welcome you. But if it's your first time here at First Baptist, uh, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, our prayer is you're going to feel like you're part of the uh, family of First Baptist this morning and we'll worship the Lord and experience the Lord. Uh, at the end of the service, the pastor and I are going to be out in the foyer. We would love for you to uh, come by and let us meet you. Uh, this morning, we want to say thank you for being uh, here uh, today. Well, this is an exciting week. It's the week of Christmas. If you haven't uh, gone online yet and registered, uh, which Christmas Eve service you're going to attend, I encourage you to do so. Uh, on our website, there's also a QR code on the back of the bulletin. You can use that as well. Uh, 
the software that we use, it, it, it prints out or it provides some tickets. You don't need a ticket to come. Uh, it's just, it helps us to regulate and know how many uh, to prepare for each service. Uh, our pastor has a time with the children and he has a gift for each one and we want to make sure we have plenty of, of gifts as well as prepare the Lord's Supper for each service. So if you would uh, do that, we'd appreciate it. Those times this uh, Friday are 2 o'clock, 3.30, uh, 5 o'clock and 6.30 and it's always an incredible, incredible time as we worship the Lord together. Uh, we're also just a few days away from a new year. Uh, we have a new Bible reading plan uh, for uh, 2022. Our emphasis of the year is called We Believe. We're going to start a new uh, series of lessons in our Connect group as well as our Bible reading plan on some of the great truths of the Scripture. And uh, I want to encourage you, if, uh, if you haven't picked up a reading plan, they're out in the foyer at the Welcome Center, do so. Uh, in fact, just this uh, little reading plan, not only is it a good guide, but we're going to be reading a chapter each day about that particular truth that we're going to study the following Sunday. And that's, uh, this is worth its uh, gold right here, uh, just having that concordance about those, uh, those doctrines and where uh, that doctrine's found in Scripture. In addition, there are some journals that our communication department has uh, produced. Uh, we have about 650 out there. We'll have more in this week. They'll be here for the Christmas Eve service and for next Sunday if we run out this morning. But it's a great journal to be able to write down what God said to you through your da uh, daily Bible reading as well as place for sermon notes and connect group notes. Uh, it's just a great gift. And so I want to invite you to pick one up. Uh, this morning. Let's bow together in prayer and we'll continue on in worshiping through music this morning. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to gather uh, this morning, this Sunday before we celebrate uh, Christmas. Lord, we thank you that God became flesh. You are Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, we thank you that in your divine plan that Lord you provided a way that we could be called your children by sending your son Jesus Christ to this world that he would seek and save those who are lost Lord we thank you that because Jesus was born that he was also willing to give his life to pay the price for our sins that we could never pay and as a result we can be your children Lord, this morning, speak to us through the message. Show us yourself through the music. Speak to us through the scripture, through our prayers. Lord, even through our fellowship time together today. And Lord, we pray for our pastor that you will anoint him with your spirit and prepare our hearts so that we'll be transformed through the power of your word, through the Holy Spirit as he speaks to us. And it's in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. A QR code on the website. There's four signs you're getting old. One, you start carrying a pocket knife. Two, you check the rain gauge every time it rains. Three, you put your ice cream in the microwave. Kind of knock the hardness off. Four is you don't have a clue what a QR code is. Now, I bought a washer and dryer this week, and it said to register your product, use the QR code. Well, they gave you an option, praise God. You can still register it by filling out that little form and mailing it in. You know where you put your, all those little blocks there, G-R-E-G -E space C R. I did that, and I'm going to mail that bad boy in because I don't know what a QR code is. And if you don't, don't worry about it. Just call us up here and tell us when you're coming, and we'll save a place for you. How about that? I'm so old, I still owe Moses a dollar. Let's stand together. The first Noel, let's sing it together. Raise your voices as we celebrate the newborn king. The first Noel.
you so much, and you may be seated. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, choir and orchestra, not only for today, but thank you for Christmas in the Ville last week. It was just outstanding. 
Greg, I saw a vest and a pair of pants in the choir. If y'all all get together, you'll have a whole suit. Now you'll have to, you'll have to pass it around, take turns with it. But well, good to see you today. Thanks for being here. We're glad that you came to worship with us today. Uh, if you'll take your Bible, uh, we're going to look at several passages today, but I'm going to read to start with what I think is the heart of the Christmas story. It's in Luke chapter 2. You'll find the Christmas events in Matthew 1 and 2, Luke 1 and 2, but uh, I'm going to start reading in Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to pick it up in verse 4. That's not where the story begins, but that's where I'm going to pick it up this morning, so if you want to follow with me, Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. And Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him snugly in cloth and laid him in a feeding trough because there was no room for them at the inn. Now, obviously, that is the heart of the story of the birth of Jesus. We use the word nativity a lot. We have nativity scenes and nativity sets. The word nativity comes from a Latin word that means birth, so that's where that comes from. It's the birth of Jesus. We all love nativity scenes. We have a huge one out in the parking lot, across the parking lot. It's it's enormous. It's a football field long. By the way, tomorrow night at 6.30, we're going to have hot chocolate out there and just an old-fashioned carol sing. So if you'd like to come by and spend a few minutes with friends and just sing some Christmas carols there in front of that manger scene, that was built for us a few years ago by Dr. Tommy Crunk, who remembered a, a, a set like that or a scene like that that used to be at the Parthenon in Nashville when he was a child. I think that was back in the 1800s sometime. I'm not exactly sure when, but he wanted us to have one and so he built one like that, and now it's something that we use every year. Uh, but we have nativity sets all over the place. There's one down in the entrance to the chapel that has Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. There's several over. I was walking through the preschool area this week. There's several of them over there. There are uh, nativity scenes and sets everywhere you look. We have them in our homes, right? You have, you have some at your home. This is my favorite one. I keep this in my office, and I keep it there year-round. It's not just something I pull out at Christmas. I love this one because I got it in Bethlehem. So it came from the place where Jesus was born, and this is the branch of an olive tree. If I were able to hand it to you, you'd see that it's very heavy. It's just been cut off on both ends. But here's the neat part. On the inside, it's been hollowed out. And the artist has taken the different characters of the Christmas story the nativity and place them inside this olive branch to remind us that Jesus born in a manger died on a cross for our sin so what I thought I'd do today is to just point out to you all the different characters here in the story all of the different the crew of Christmas if you will and talk about each of them so let's focus first of all let's focus on this one everybody look at well that's kind of hard to see isn't it so let's use a little bigger one I'll put that to the side and let's use a little bigger one the first person of this story is Mary now, Mary is central to it, obviously, because it was Mary to whom the angel came and told her that she was going to give birth and uh, have a baby. Now, you know, interestingly, Mary had a cousin who was named Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was also expecting a baby. And when Elizabeth and Mary got together one day, the same angel had come to both of them. Gabriel had come to Elizabeth six months earlier and then came to Mary to tell both of them that they were, they were going to expect a baby. And when they got together to kind of compare notes, do you know that the Bible says that the baby inside of Elizabeth, when, when the baby heard Mary's voice, the baby inside of Elizabeth, who would become John the Baptist, the Bible says that baby leaped inside of his mother's womb. Don't tell me that an unborn baby is not a living, breathing human being. That child was the first one other than Mary himself to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So Mary was... Scripture used the word engaged, but that's a, that's a 
hard word for us to grasp because here's what we think about when we think about engagement. You know, a couple meets when they're in high school or maybe in college, maybe out of college, they're in the working world, and they meet, and they start dating, and they're dating other people, but soon they kind of just like each other, and they're just kind of dating exclusively, and then they start talking about marriage, and then they decide they're going to get married. Now, the period of time between when they decide they're going to get married and when they get married, no matter how long that is, whether it's a week or a month or a year, whatever it is, we call that the engagement. And so we kind of think that way when it comes to this account in Scripture that tells us about these two being engaged, but that's not the way that it was. As a matter of fact, this was a contractual agreement that had gone back many, many years, not between these two individuals, but between their parents. And the parents of this woman and the parents of this man had made an agreement, a contractual agreement, a legally binding agreement years before that when their children were of the age that they would be married. Now, that was a betrothal period. They're not married yet. They're not living together as husband and wife. She's probably, she looks a little bit older right here, but she's probably about 14 or 15 years old when this all occurs. And when she is told by this angel who had also told her cousin that she was expecting a child, when the angel told Mary, she was terrified. Can you imagine? I mean, what's she going to tell her parents? How's she going to explain this? What's she going to tell her friends? What's she going to tell Joseph? She even said in Scripture in the first chapter of Luke, when the angel came to her, she said, how can this be? I'm reading the 34th verse of chapter 1 of Luke. Luke 1, 34. How can this be, she asked the angel, since I have not been intimate. Now notice what she said. She didn't say, I have not been intimate with Joseph. She said, I have not been intimate with anybody. I haven't been in, intimate with any man. How can this possibly be? And it was in that moment that the angel told her that the child that is placed in you is of the Holy Spirit. So there's Mary. Well, the second important person here is Joseph. Now, Joseph, we'll find his story back over in the book of Matthew, and it's particularly in chapter 1, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 1. And, and Joseph is kind of the forgotten man of this story. He's the quiet one. We don't know too much about Joseph. As a matter of fact, would it surprise you? Thank you, guys. I've got some help from my friends today to set all this up, and I appreciate them doing that very much. Uh, would it surprise you to know that there is not one single recorded word anywhere in the Bible that came from this man? Never said anything. Now, he had some conversations with God, and we know some things that he was thinking. The Bible tells us what he was thinking. But there's never a statement that is attributed to Joseph in all of this. Now, I would have loved to have heard the conversation between her and him when she told him she was going to have a baby. Now, this isn't in the Bible, so don't go looking for this. And don't, you know, I'm, I'm telling you up front, this is not in the Bible. This is my sanctified imagination. I'm just imagining what it would have been like. Can you imagine? Maybe they were talking about their upcoming wedding. They've set a date. And maybe she said, well, Joseph, I've been thinking about the, the reception after the wedding, and, and I thought for the meal that we would start with a shrimp cocktail, and maybe from that we'll have baked potatoes and uh, steak and green beans, and I'm pregnant, and then maybe we'll have cheesecake for dessert. And I can hear him saying, what? What, what did you just say? I said we'll have shrimp cocktail and steak and baked. No, what would you say after that? I said we'd have cheesecake for dessert. Now, what did you say between green beans and cheesecake? I'm having a baby. I'm having a baby. Now, one thing he knew for sure, whatever else he knew or didn't know, one thing he knew for sure, if she's having a baby, the baby's not his. Of that, he is positive. Now, if you follow with me in Matthew chapter 1, let me just kind of tell you this from his vantage point. Verse 18 says, The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged, that's betrothed, I just described it, to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he'd considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him. That angel's been busy, hasn't he? 
An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. I'm telling you, this man doesn't have a recorded word anywhere in Scripture, but this was a man of deep faith to believe what the Holy Spirit told him, to accept that, and to go through with what the, what the angel told him to do that day. Joseph was a great man of God. Now, the third part of this story is right here. This is, we call it a stable. We think of stables as something like this made out of wood. It's a place where we build a barn. We put an animal in a stable. So this is a stable for us. But that's not what their stable would have looked like. As a matter of fact, the words that are used to describe that, and if you go to Bethlehem today, you can go to the place where it's been believed for centuries that Jesus was born. A church was built there as early as the 300s, 325 Constantinople, uh, or excuse me, Constantine built a church over this cave, and for hundreds of years before that, all the way back to the first century, people had said, this is the place where Jesus was born. It's a cave. When you go to that church today, you, there's an ornate church that's been built over the top of it, but you walk down steps to go inside of this cave. Now, you won't feel like you're in a cave because the walls and the ceiling have been covered with Persian rugs, and they did that because people like us, tourists, would be chipping off little pieces of that cave every time we went in it, and it would be about the size of Mammoth Cave now if, if they had not protected it in some way. So you don't necessarily feel like you're in a cave, but you are. Now, if you want to get to the feel of the cave, you don't have to go very far, just a few blocks, and you go to the shepherd's fields. The fields today that shepherds keep flocks and watch their flocks in are the same fields that 2,000 years ago shepherds watched their flocks. And there are caves there at those fields where the shepherds would protect themselves, where the shepherds would sleep, sometimes where the shepherds would, would place their animals. You can get the feel of what the maybe even one of the very same cave that some of the shepherds were in that night. It's the, it's the barn, if you will, the cave where Jesus was born. The fourth part of this is the manger. That's the place where she took the baby and laid him. When I was reading it in, in uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 7, you heard me say that she gave birth to a son. She wrapped him snugly, and she placed him in a feeding trough. Now, we think of something that looks kind of like this. Thank you, Daniel. We think of something that's kind of got that X wood, you know, and, and it, then it's got slats across the side, and you can put hay in it or whatever it is that you're feeding. That's not what it looked like at all. It wasn't made out of wood, just as the stable wasn't made out of wood. It was, it was made out of stone. As a matter of fact, I have a picture of an actual manger. They, they, you see these all over Israel. They go all the way back before the time of Solomon. It, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of stone, and, and, and the inside has been hewn out. And so you could put water in there. You could put grain in there. You could put hay in there, whatever you wanted to. Some of them are very low to the ground for the smaller animals. Some of them are taller for the taller animals, the camels and the horses and donkeys, those kinds of animals. That, that's what a manger actually would have looked like. That's what she laid him in that night when he was born. That's the manger. She laid him in a feeding trough. Now, that brings me to the next person in this story, and he's the star of it all. His name is Jesus. This is all about him, and he's central. Anytime you see a nativity scene, a set, Jesus ought to be in the middle of it because Jesus is central to all of it. This is all about the birth of Jesus. This is the most important event that ever happened in the history of the world. Somebody would say, well, what about the crucifixion and the resurrection? Well, the crucifixion and the resurrection would have never happened had the birth not happened. This was the most important event. This event split time. Even today, 2,000 years later, we still talk about what happened before Christ and what happened after Christ. Now, did you know that archaeologists and modern-day um, Scholars want to take that designation out. They don't want you talking about B.C. and A.D. anymore because B.C. refers to before Christ. A.D. refers to in the year of our Lord, and they don't want any reference to those truths of God. And so now archaeologists and, and scholars refer to B.C.E., the initials B.C.E. It stands for Before Common Era, E-R-A, Era. 
And then CE, common era. We live in the common era. Anything back before? Well, here's the question. Before what? Before what? Well, it's before the birth of Jesus. Now, you can use all the letters in the alphabet that you want to, but this is all about the birth of Jesus. It's the birth of Jesus that split history. It's the birth of Jesus that was the day that God became a man. God took on the robes of humanity. We sang it just a little while ago. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. God became a man. That's what Christmas is. This summer, Joy and I were working outside, and I had the garage door up. This has probably happened to you at some point along the way, maybe not with a bird, but with a varmint of some kind, a squirrel or something. We're working outside. I had a garage door up. A bird flew into our garage. Now, I spent the next hour trying to get the bird out of the garage. Now, the problem is that the threshold of the top of the garage, the bird has to come down to get out, and the bird's not interested in coming down with me with a broom trying to get him out of there. I opened every one of the garage doors. I am running through the inside of the garage trying to get this bird out, and this bird is doing everything he or she can to stay away from me and will not get out. And I had the thought that day, if I could just become a bird, if I could just say to that bird, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not trying to capture you. I'm not trying to harm you. I'm not trying to hurt you with this broom. I'm just trying to get you out so that you can be free to fly. If I could just communicate. God became a man so that he could show us the way to live life. He became a man to pay the price for our sin. He became a man to show us the way that we could have salvation. This is all about Jesus. He is central to it all. The next part of this are the animals. In a, in a nativity, there are always animals. And so my friends are going to bring in some small animals and some big animals. And so you ask yourself, well, which ones were really at the, uh, at the manger that day? Which ones of these were actually a part of the story? Well, in Scripture, none. Not an animal is mentioned in this. So why is it that every nativity that you've ever seen, everyone at your house, everyone that we have, why is it that they always have animals? Well, there are several reasons. One reason, thank you guys, one reason is because if this guy, I don't know if you can see that very well, get a camera on that. If that is not Joe Camel, I don't know what is. That is Joe Camel. Uh, we won't go there right now. There's several reasons why the animals were there. Number one, it's a barn. And uh, the, the scripture says that there was no room in the inn, and we kind of read between the lines and say, well, th there's no room at the inn. Somebody said to them, here's a place that you can stay. You can get in out of the weather. You've at least got some hay. This woman's pregnant. She doesn't need to just be left outside at this critical time of her life. So somebody, we assume the innkeeper, somebody made available a barn. Now, they would not have kicked their animals out for these strangers. They're just making it available to them if they want to use that. That's probably one reason. Another reason is probably because shepherds are going to be involved in this in just a moment. Shepherds were watching over their flock. Maybe some of their flock followed them. Maybe, some of the, they, maybe they brought some of the weaker, smaller ones of their flock with them. We don't know exactly. But I think the more important reason is probably found back in the Old Testament. Psalm chapter 8 makes a wonderful statement about how God created man. In verse 6 it says, You made him, talking about man, you made him Lord over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, all the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, passing through the currents of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. I think this is a picture that he is Lord over all creation. And everything that he made, he made for a purpose. And God allowed us as mankind to have dominion over the animals and the fish and the birds. God created them for us to use and for our enjoyment and for our benefit. But he is the one who is Lord of all. And even the animals themselves recognize who the Lord God is. So they're these animals. The next element here is the angel. Now the angel's been busy in this, hasn't he? or she, the angel has gone to several to uh, give this word. And you know, it's interesting to me that the angel going to um, Elizabeth, the angel going to Mary, the angel going to Joseph, 
the angel going to the shepherds. It's interesting to me that the angel, who, by the way, we believe is the same angel. His name is Gabriel. It, it's interesting that in all four cases, the first thing that the angel said to each of those individuals or groups was the same. Thank you, guys. And what the angel said was, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Listen, listen to me now. We live in a world that is desperately afraid. We are afraid of the health crisis. We are afraid of global warming and what that means. We are afraid of the political climate. We are afraid of crime. We are afraid. We are afraid. We are afraid. And this message to us is from the heart of God. Don't be afraid. I've got this. I've got this. Nothing's backed me into a corner. Nothing's caught me off guard. Nothing has surprised me. Nothing has gone on that I did not know was going to go on. And at just the right time, in just the right way, at just the right moment, in just the right place, my will is going to be accomplished. So stop fretting over things that you can't control. I've got this. Let not your heart be troubled. I've read that that phrase, fear not, is found 365 times in the Bible. Now, I've never counted them. I don't know if that is true or not. But if that is true, that means that for every single day of the year, there is a word in Scripture, a, a different word for every single day of the year that says, don't be afraid. The angel came to tell them to fear not. Well, then there were some shepherds. I don't know how many shepherds there were. The Bible doesn't say. But it does say that they were out in the field keeping watch over their flock when this angel came to them. And the angel brought this message to say, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of God a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, why did God use shepherds? It's interesting, isn't it? These were the, if I can use this term, uh, these were the, the lower class people, the low lives of society, if you will. Everybody looked down on shepherds. Most of them had no home. They lived in tents. They were Bedouins. They traveled here and there. They had nowhere to lay their head. They lived with animals. They lived outside all of the time. They were always around the fire. Uh, they smelled like smoke. They were dirty. They were unkept. They smelled like sheep. They were just undesirable people. Now, isn't it interesting that it's these people to whom he brought this message? And from this day on... These were the ones that everybody was seeking out to say, what did the angel say? Tell us what you saw. These people became very important in this unfolding story. They became the, the first evangelist, if you will, to share the good news of what God had done. It's a reminder to me that God uses common, ordinary people. That he didn't come to die for presidents and kings and princes. He, he did die for them, but he came to die for you and for me and for the ordinary people of this world. The next part of this story is up above my head. It's a star. And uh, the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 2 that there was a star that appeared now people try to figure this star out you know and and folks do all this study and they come away with this idea well maybe it was Halley's Comet it was this comet that appeared in 5 BC and uh, maybe that was it or it was this look stop all you're trying to figure that out this was a supernatural event Halley's Comet had it been that would have been there and been gone this was there for months it moved as these uh, people following and moved along the way. This was a supernatural occurrence that God used. Why did God use this star? Well, I think it might have been because in just a few years, Jesus was going to say, I'm the light of the world. And whoever will follow me, whoever will come to me will not walk in darkness. We live in a dark world, don't we? And our dark world needs to learn, and the only way they're going to learn this is through the power and the Word of God. Our world needs to learn that, that He is the light of the world, and in Him there is no darkness at all. And so there was this star that appeared when you read in Matthew chapter 2. That leads me to the last part of this group. They're the wise men. Sometimes we call them kings. We three kings of Orient are bearing gifts. We've traveled afar, you know. Um, some folks have named these guys for us. Now, the Bible doesn't do that, but 
Uh, tradition says that one of them is named Gaspar, one of them's named Melchior, one of them's named Belshazzar. Now, those are hard names, so we would probably give them nicknames. He'd be Shaz, and he'd be Mel, and he'd be Gassy, I guess. I don't know. but we'd, we'd, uh, Now, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't give us any names for these guys, and the Bible doesn't tell us how many of them there were. Uh, we say three because three gifts are mentioned, and it's assumed that all of them would have brought a gift. But it could be like your connect group party where four people bring a vegetable and three people bring a dessert and, and uh, uh, two people bring bread, you know. Two could have brought frankincense. Four could have brought gold. We don't really know that. But traditionally, they, they're three. Now, let me read what the Bible says about this. I'm reading in... Matthew chapter 2, and I'm picking it up in verse 9. It says, After hearing the king, now the king is Herod, and the king asked them, When did you first see the star? That's what he's interested in. When did you first see this star? When did this miracle begin to unfold? After hearing the king, they went on their way. There it was, the star that they had seen in the east. It led them until it came and stopped a play to the, above the place where the child was. Now, that is another way to know that it's a supernatural light. You've never seen a star. You've never, ever seen a star that came and you knew it was over one house. You can't even tell what region it's over. When you get to where you think it is, it's somewhere else. This was a supernatural light that God gave that came to stop above the house. They're not in this anymore. These, these shepherds have already gone back to the fields. These animals are all gone. Mary and Joseph, they're not in this cave anymore. They're in a house. The Bible's very specific about that. Now, how do we know that? Well, one way is because when Herod gives the decree to kill all the baby boys, he says that are two years old and younger. Where did he get that number from? He didn't just draw it out of the air. He's going back to what they told him. When did you first see this star? When did this all start unfolding? And what they told him and the length of time that it took them to get to Bethlehem is why he went back two years to make sure he killed the right baby. These men came from afar bearing gifts, and the Bible says that they fell when they came to the house. It said where the child was. Did you notice that? It didn't say baby. The word for baby is the word for infant. The word that's used here for them is the word toddler, child. They came to the house where, they, where the child was. Now, let me tell you a couple of things about them. First of all, the Bible says that when they saw the child, they worshiped him. When you really come into the presence of Jesus, you worship. The second thing was that they gave him their best. They didn't bring secondary gifts. They gave him the very best that they had to give. When we truly come into the presence of Jesus, we worship him and we worship him. We bring him our best. Now, I was praying about this sermon this week for several reasons one because most of the time when I preach a sermon it's just me doing it and if I mess up it's on me I just messed up but I had a lot of hands helping me this week and I wanted to make sure that we did things kind of in the right way so I found myself in here several times this week just praying and thinking and figuring out how to do what I was going to do and I was sitting right back there about where Larry and Linda are sitting and and it was almost like the Lord spoke to me one day I was sitting in here and the lights were kind of low but I saw the cross kind of back behind this, over it, kind of shadowing it. And the thought occurred to me that, that it, this is the Christmas picture. It's not just the, the, the angels and the wise men and the Mary and Joseph in the stable. He came born in a stable to die on a cross. And everything Jesus did, everything Jesus said, everything, everywhere Jesus went was pointing to the cross. He came into this world with one purpose. That was to die on a cross for my sin and your sin, to be raised back to life, to ascend back to heaven so that one day he will return and establish his kingdom. Now this is the Christmas story. What other customs we have, what other traditions we'll follow through with this week, this is what the Christmas story is all about. So you go back in your mind, not just 2,000 years to when it really happened, but you go back to when it came to life for you, 
When did you come to realize that this is God who came in the flesh to die on a cross to pay the price for your sin? Until you come to understand that, until you have a relationship with him because of that, none of this really matters. You're just going through motions. You're just keeping customs until this comes to life in you. Jesus died on a cross for you, and he wants to save you if you'll just open your heart and let him. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for the picture that's right here in front of us right now. Thank you for what this represents. Thank you for the cross that's back there behind it, overshadowing it. You can't look at this scene in this room without seeing the cross behind it and over it, just shadowing it. Everything you came to do was about the cross. You lived a perfect life to pay the price as the Lamb of God on the cross. You lived your life without sin so that the one who was without sin might become sin for us. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for that person that they, they know the story. They could have told me about every person that I mentioned, every part of the Christmas scene. They could have told me something about it, but they've never come to the relationship with Jesus. I pray that that might become real. We really haven't celebrated Christmas. We really don't know what it's all about until we have a relationship with Jesus. So, Lord, speak to our hearts right now. Do in us what only you can do is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Bruce and I are going to be standing here. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. It's an opportunity for you to come and let one of us pray with you or encourage you, help you make whatever spiritual decision you're dealing with in your life to help you know the Lord, to know that you know that you know who Jesus is. We want to give you a chance to do that. If you'd like to become a part of our church, we'll help you with that. Just come to one of us right now. We'll help you walk through that. Let's stand together while Greg leads us in this song. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weak, I pray, power, all oh power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. I've heard many Christmas messages through the years. I think this is the most real Christmas message I have ever heard. Thank you, Pastor. If you have a spiritual decision to make, Pastor and I are going to be out in the foyer. We would be honored uh, to visit with you, to pray with you, uh, help you with any decision or prayer request that, uh, that you have. Our Gideons are still out in the foyer. This is their last Sunday to be uh, there. Uh, we'll share a report in the next few uh, days. We have given thousands of Bibles so uh, for the Gideons to distribute both locally and globally. Uh, but if you haven't given, I encourage you to do so. So every dollar goes directly for the purchase of Bibles uh, to, to be shared with those that, uh, that do not have those. As the pastor shared, tomorrow evening, 6.30, uh, out in the parking lot uh, by the Nativity, we're just going to gather, have a carol sing, just a time of fellowship. We'll have no activities this uh, coming Wednesday, but we'll see you Friday at our Christmas Eve service. Have a wonderful week. God bless you. Let's Greg? sing, shall we? Emmanuel. Emmanuel, his name is called.
Emmanuel, God with us, reveal in us, His name is called Emmanuel. Have a great day. See you next week. chose to send his one and only son, Jesus, to give his life as the final payment for all sin. And so, after 400 years of silence between God and his people, he sent a messenger to a chosen one, a young virgin girl named Mary. Greetings. O oh, favored one, the Lord God is with you. Do not be afraid, for you have found faith.